my name is Alfred Jock, and they call me Alfie. Um, my Haudenosaunee name is Anasagungake. That means old house. Uh, one of my nicknames when I played lacrosse, I played goalie. So they call me Seymour Shots. I remember when I was like four or five years old, my father's stick was standing in the corner near the closet. It was all leather, and that was, it was a goalie stick, and it was always over in the corner. And I always saw that stick. And then I was about five or six, my mother took me to the games. My father was like a, a, a player coach. And uh, I'd go to games on the Onondaga Nation, an outdoor box, and a lot of excitement, people running back and forth, and, you know, people yelling and war hoops and stuff, and it was, it was quite exciting. And uh, the kids are running around playing. And my mother says, I don't want you to run around and play. You sit here and you watch. She said, uh, one day you're going to be a lacrosse player and you got to know what to do, so sit here and watch, which I did. <laughs> and I became a lacrosse player. So. I have a brother, and he was, he's two years older than me. Um, he's like 71 right now. And he was a real good lacrosse player, a real tough, hard-shooting, hard-scoring lacrosse player. And uh, he was pretty good. He coached for a while. And now he's retired and gol golfs all the time. Clyde, Clyde Jock. Um, I have uh, two sisters. Uh, one is 68 years old. She's a clan mother at Onondaga. Her name is Frida. And my sister Stephanie, which you met, um, she's a professor at the University of Toronto. PhD. And of course I have a wife named Catherine. And I have a son named Ryder and he's 32 years old. Uh, my father, Louis, he passed away in 1985. And my mother passed away two years ago, Ada, Adelaide. And she, she did her whole career, and when she retired, she started pottery. And she became an excellent potter, very good artist. She worked that right up until she died. My dad was a carpenter. And he did a lot of different things but he was mainly a carpenter. Now, in making lacrosse sticks, to, in the beginning, I didn't have a stick. I was borrowing my father's stick. I was borrowing my brother's stick. And I kept, we kept going on like that. Uh, this was 57 years ago. I was about 12 years old. My father said, so what the heck, let's make our own. So. We went in the woods, cut down a tree, a hickory tree, split it in pieces, and pretty, messed, pretty much messed up a whole bunch of wood. But we did it again and did it again, and we got wood to bend and have the shape, and my father understood all the concepts of uh, splitting, shaping, uh, steaming, bending, drying, drilling, carving, all that. And he bought a knife, and he made a, a quick bench, and we started making lacrosse sticks. But before that, <laughs> I loved making lacrosse sticks from the start. Before that, when I was about five years old, my grandmother made the Mohawk basket out of black ash wood. She was sitting there shaving splints, cutting splints, and I was sitting on the floor watching. She's in a rocking chair, whistling away back and forth. And she kept looking at me, and I kept watching, watching, watching. And she took a whole bunch of splints and dumped them on me. And she took out a jackknife and handed me a sharp jackknife. And she says, you do what I do, Watch me, do what I do. I'll show you how to make baskets. So she got me carving, shaping splints, smoothing them out and putting baskets together. So I started carving when I was five years old, not a knife. And that's the truth. So she got me started. And when my father decided to make sticks, I jumped right into it. I loved carving. I loved making wood, wooden sticks. Well, in high school, I used to pick apples. I work on a farm. I did farm work and pick apples. Um, I was a painter, a mason, sandblaster, working construction. Pretty much anything came along. Um, and I became a machinist. I lucked into being a machinist. And I made rocket engine parts. 
uh, for like upper stage propulsion, an RL10 liquid uh, fuel, uh, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen fuel mix. I made many components for the whole injector itself. I did that all on manual machines. Pretty good work. Wow. Pretty good work, yeah. It's like when you're doing rocket engine parts, it's like you don't make mistakes, right? It's yeah. like perfect paper, perfect parts, perfect everything. I was teaching a kid how to make a cutter, and he made it wrong. And he was pretty close, but I looked at it, and I says, well, the cutter comes down and angles in all right, and then it goes back out three thousandths, goes back in two. He said, you're crazy. So I put on a comparator, blew it up, this teeny little cutter, I blew it up to about maybe that long and that wide. It was on a comparator where you could see. And you actually could see it came in, went out three thousandths, went back in two thousandths. And he says, how'd you do that? Just the way it is. Just the way it is. I could see it. Well, I've always had good eyes. See more shots, you know. Well, I played for Onondaga Miners. They didn't have the different divisions. So I played with the Miners when I was about 12 years old till 17, maybe. Well, the game's been in my blood for my whole life since I was five years old. And when I was a machinist, I was actually away from the game for a while. Now, I got away from the game because well, I played goalie. Okay, so. I got hit a lot in the head. I didn't duck. <laughs> I never ducked. I got it, bang, you know. So it's just like getting punched in the jaw. And uh, well, make a long story longer, I was working in, well, as a roadie for a band for a short while in the off season. And uh, I was taking care of things. And a fight broke out in a bar, in a club. and. The guy got knocked to the ground, and the guy was kicking him. I stepped up, I said, hey, leave him alone, he's, he's down. And some guy jumped in, sucker punched me, hit me right in the jaw, bam. I looked at him, I said, I wasn't even talking to you. So the other guy hit me, bam. I said, what? Nothing happened, nothing happened. I took two downtowners, not even looking, I didn't see it coming. Two downtowners, one this side, one this side, right in the jaw, and nothing happened. And it scared the heck out of me. And I thought, man, I better get out of this game. So at 26 years old, it was done. Really? Yeah. 26. So, yeah. But I didn't want to get Dane Bramage. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's why I got out of the game at the time. And when I got back into it, I went in as an assistant coach. And then ended up, I inherited the team, so I ended up head coach, general manager, and all that. And then Onondaga Red Hawks. Um, Barry Paulus got me back into it. And um, when I inherited the team from him, because he, he, he quit and he went away, and uh, somebody got to do it, right? So I was doing it. So I had the team. And I'm not a great coach, but I'm a good manager. And by managing, I took the team into championships and eventually President's Cup and won that. I enjoy managing, I really did. Yeah. 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 I don't like to tell people what to do. I just make good suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> well, the President's Cup, 2010, it was, um, we had a real good team. And you're like, as a coach, if, if the, when the players are out on the field and and the players do what you told them to do. It's like, wow, hey, that's great, you know? They did everything we trained them for all the games of the President's Cup, the full week. They were doing exactly what we trained them to do. And that, that felt pretty good. And like in our final game, we won the final 14 to seven. 14 to seven, that's a final game. You know, it's like, wow, it should be like nine to eight, right? Yeah. No, it was 14 to seven, dominated. That felt pretty good. And then, you know, after eight games, you got players with a bad knee, a bad ankle, and they're still running. They got the heart in it, you know? Yeah, it was pretty good. It felt really good. Uh, well, the way things have developed, 
since I stopped being a machinist. I got to travel to Toronto and many other places, uh, um, speaking of my craft, speaking of the game, uh, the development, the sticks, the old sticks, um, the sticks from other tribes, the different balls and the way they play. And uh, the speaking part of it is pretty good. As a historian in lacrosse, it's really good to go and tell people stuff. They, oh, I didn't know that. No, I never knew that. And you're informing them and educating them on the game. And that was pretty good. I've been to uh, Phoenix, Albuquerque, Denver, uh, Navajo Reservation, um, Washington, Philadelphia, Baltimore, um, Poughkeepsie, out in Maine, um, Boston, uh, a couple of places near Boston, uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and a lot of points in between. So, you know, travel around and been to a lot of things. I can't even remember them all. Different universities, um, Yale, Villanova, Cornell, Ithaca, Syracuse, Hobart. I did a lot of schools and museums. I've done a lot of things though. Been a lot of places. Actually, I have something here I'm gonna show you. This is, uh... wow. <laughs> This is lanyards. Yes. <laughs> From all over. All over. Many, many different places. I mean, you can't even name them all, but I've been to quite a few. There's the Ontario Lacrosse Hall of Fame right there. Hey. So, been a lot of places, and I wouldn't have been there if I didn't, if I wasn't with lacrosse. I brought with me my President's Cup gold medal, which is like my pride and joy. Um, Mountain Dog Red Hawk team has been to the President's Cup, but never won. And so 2010, we kicked some butt and we got this. I got a ring, there's my championship ring, and there's my medal. So very, very proud of that. And it took me, it was eight years of coaching to get that. It's a good teaching tool. As I tell people, they don't, they don't give these away. You have to earn them. And you earn them by working hard, practicing, showing up to practice all the time, and you know, put the work in, and that's how you get these rings. When I got this, I retired. So that's what that is. Very proud of that. Back in the early days, like in, in Syracuse, the universities, um, Hobart, um, Cornell, Syracuse University, um, they didn't have a lot of competition around. So they would play against the local Indian nations to get, have experience. And so Syracuse University always came down to Onondaga. They'd play in the box. And then the team would go from the box, they'd go up and they'd play field lacrosse against Syracuse, back and forth, and they would do that. So this was, uh, what, 1956? Jim Brown, All-American football player, All-American lacrosse player, came down with Syracuse. And um, one of our local players, he was about 150 pounds, maybe. And a young guy, Irving Paulus. Junior. He was a left handed player. And uh, big Jim Brown, his legs are this big around, you know, come running down the field. And he would, he'd fake the guy and he'd turn, he'd throw the hip out, throw the hip. The honchique, they bump hips, that's what it means, right? And back then the hip check was very popular. A lot of people could do it. This guy was real good at it. He hip checked Jim Brown, Jim Brown, boom. What happened? Well, that little guy just knocked him down. And he didn't like it very much, but it happened a couple times during the game. So there's a little Indian guy, hip check, bang, knocked him down. He doesn't like to hear about it, but it actually happened. So, yeah. So you don't have to be big and strong. That's what my mother always told me about the game. You don't have to be like a football player. You don't have to be big and strong. You can be smart. Be fast, be slick, know how to use the stick. 
and that's what it takes. Yep, she was right. <laughs> There's so many. Um, Eli Cornelius at Onondaga, he was a stick maker. But he would gather up the boys who wanted to play, and he would take us up to Six Nation or uh, Tuscarora to play minor games. Kids, we were kids. It might have been kids like from uh, 12 years old up to 16, but it was, it was a team. That was before there was uh, all the, the different organizations, but he took it on himself to take us on his own dime to go and play lacrosse. He was a builder then, and I appreciated what he did. And he was a stick maker. <laughs> um, this is the first box lacrosse stick that I kept for myself. So the stick maker has a good stick, right? And so I'd go to practice, and the guys would be looking at my stick. And they'd offer me so much money for it. If it was like 20 bucks, they'd offer me 25. How about 30? How about 40? You know, and so, oh, okay, and I'd sell it and I'd make another one the next day. So I kept selling my sticks. Then in 1978, I said, I just got to keep one. So this is the one I kept. It's smooth as butter. Anybody pick this up, throw the ball right to the target immediately. You don't have to practice with this. This is a magic stick, very <laughs> magical. So this is my old stick. And of course, some people know what this is, some people don't. This is one of the very first plastic head wooden handle sticks that they made. It was a box stick made, I think, near Toronto. It's yes, called a switch yes. shooter yeah, near Toronto. Yeah. And uh, it's called a switch shooter. Any, anyway, leather pocket. And it didn't really go that far. First of all, it was ugly. And when you got people with top-notch good wooden sticks, this couldn't even fit in. But it was a start. And a lot of people, before this even, they always tried to make something faster and cheaper. I didn't say better, but faster and cheaper because a wooden stick takes 10 months to a year to make. So hence, faster and cheaper. So this one didn't fly. Okay, this is, um, in high school, I was all county and all upstate. That was before they had state championships. But I was a crease attack. This was my stick in 1967. And I made all my own sticks for myself in high school, four years of high school. Now what I did is I gave it the uh, offset head balance. So the offset that they were putting in the plastic sticks and handles is what my father and I used to do in the 60s. So I, I don't expect any royalties from it, but, but this is what we did. Wow. So this is a replica. Uh, 1890, 1880, 1890 replica that I made, and totally usable. You can actually throw and catch and play the game with this stick. It's all gut rawhide netting, which is what they always did. And um, instead of tape, you put a ball on the end, so you'll have tape on the end. But I make uh, and sell quite a few of these replicas. Pretty cool, people like to have those. And last is the modern box across stick. And I just made this last week. This is what I do. It's uh, perfectly balanced. It's a nice stick. Everybody likes it. And uh, it's, uh, it was probably sold before I finished it. <laughs> I got a, I got, yeah, right. <laughs> I got a list of people who want to buy my sticks. And this won't last long, it'll be gone pretty quick. So that's that. It was almost 12,000. The early 70s, you know, 71, 72, 73, 74, not 74. But that's, if you got like 12,000 a year, that's 1,000 a month, that's 250 a week. I don't know how the heck we did that. I, I have no idea, but we did. We had maybe, at tops, maybe six people doing the netting, 
putting the nets on, the gut wall leather and netting. And uh, pretty much my father and I carved all of them. Yeah, I, I don't even know how we did that. But we still played lacrosse and my father still coached. And we weren't playing or coaching, we were making sticks like seven days a week, 24 or seven, wow. all year. There was no, uh, there was no off season. That's, that's a rough one. I maybe have worked on 60,000 sticks. I mean, how do you add that up? You know, I, I don't even know, but we, I've made sticks for 57 years. Sometimes in the, in the early part, maybe 15, 20 a year, or a year, yeah. two years, the third year, maybe we were working on 100, 200, you know, and then on, yeah. it just grew from there. So I don't know, I didn't stop to count. Hickory tree has its quality, whereas you say, people say hardness, strength. You could take an oak board, put a nail in it, break, split the wood. You can take a hickory board the same size, put the same nail on it, hit it, and you bend the nail. Okay? It'll grip that, it won't go through, and it won't let it go through. It's a very dense, but as a tensile strength, uh, like a flexible strength, where it's not going to crack. Oak, you can crack a lot easier than hickory. Now, you can still break hickory, but it's stronger wood. Huh. Has uh, good strength. Uh, better than ash, better than oak, better than maple, better than anything. You make the lacrosse stick out of a living tree. You pray to God, you thank God for the tree, the land, the soil, the rain, the sun makes the tree grow. The spirit of that living tree is transferred to that lacrosse stick. You, you don't cut a, you don't take a dead tree and make a lacrosse stick. You make it out of a living tree so that that spirit is in that stick. So the player who uses that has a spirit of nature right in that stick. Well, you, you make the rawhide, yeah. the rawhide was a living animal. Yeah. Okay, the leather, you used leather, that was living too. So it was living, the entire thing was alive at one time. And some people say it's still alive when it looks like this. <laughs> yeah. The spirit of nature is in that stick and in the game. Okay, you go to the woods, you cut down a hickory tree. You can get a hickory tree about so big around. I like shag bark, it's just stronger, better wood. The bottom eight feet of the tree is what you take for the stick, so it's nice, straight, clean grain. Like a pie, it's split in half lengthwise. Half, quarter, eighths. If it's big enough, you can get 16 out of it. But you gotta know how to do it. Now you split the wood, take the split, it's shaped like a pie, with my thumbs being the bark. The point here is the center of the tree. Each piece is shaped like a pie. You trim off the corners, then you shape the wood, the bottom part of the tree, not the top. The part that you bend is the bottom of the tree, okay? This part would be down here. Because the bottom has a tree has a more flexible strength, okay? And that's scientifically, the tree sways, the whole tree flexes but this has to be strong enough to keep it up. So it don't just snap off. So the bottom of the tree has that flexibility in it, strength with flexibility. So you shape the bottom of the tree, this uh, piece of wood that's split, and then you dry it for about a month and a half. The, the wet wood will not bend, it'll break. Um, not all the time, but enough time to make it worthwhile to dry the wood. You dry the wood and after a month and a half, you put it into a steamer, which is a big tank with water in it, fire underneath, water boils, you put the wood in there, cover it with a carpet, and it'll steam for about 40 minutes. And there's a post with a form on it, which is the shape, the shape of the inside of the lacrosse stick. It's made out of wood. It's bolted to the post. You take the wood and you stick it in, you bend it all the way around. This piece here is about this long. When you bend it all the way around, and you do it just that fast, it goes quick. 
you slide up a pre-made wire, you put the wire on to hold it, and you pull it right off, and it's got the bark on it yet all the way around, and then you let it dry for approximately six more months to 10 more months. Then you steam it and you put this bend in it. And that's where you, you just, there's a pipe and a pipe and you steam it, then you lean on it. You put it in a holder, which holds this out, this in, and this out. And it'll set in about a week or two, because it's already dry. And so then you take it out, you cut us here, you cut this a little smaller, and then this piece is hand carved with a two-handed draw shaver knife and you hand carve the entire shape in many different positions to get the whole shape and size to where you want it. And then you put it in a steamer and you straighten the handle. So you straighten the handle, you balance it, not just straighten the handle, but you balance it also, so it feels good. Then you dry it some more. Then you cut the end off here, cut the end off there, and then you rebalance it. And you gotta do that a couple times. And then you drill all the holes. I have a motor with a drill in it and I push the wood into the drill. I don't mark the holes, I don't have a hand drill, I do that. So I do it all freehand by eye, all the holes. Then I have a belt sander and you do the handle, you do the top, you do that side, this side, that side, that side, this side, that side, you do everything till it's all sanded. And then I have a hand sandpaper or a hand finish it. I trim the holes with a knife. And then I burn in my logo. I sign my name. I put the date on it. And on a dog nation where the stick is made. And I shellac it. And I do all the webbing. First, then a side nylon, the four leathers down, the rawhide wall, the throwing string the rawhide throwing string, then the webbing, and then the cloth's uh, throwing string. And then it's done. And people say, how come it stops here and doesn't go all the way down? The original sticks, if they were wood all the way around, they would be way, way too heavy. So it was just bent around and then finished with rawhide, closed in. I go to a rendering house and I buy whole salted cow hides. They're real big, they're real heavy. And I have a log sitting at an angle. The log's about this big around. And it has two legs on it that hold it up. You take the hide and you throw it over it and you smooth it out. Then you have a real big, very sharp knife, a razor sharp knife. You don't scrape the hide, you slice off all the tissues. So you do a section about so big and then you turn the hide and do it again. You keep doing it till the whole side is clean. And that's, so you do the inside first, then you turn it over, you do all the first side clean, then you trim it. And then this hide, you gotta, you gotta do it really clean so it's not bumpy and this one's not, so it's even. And you put it in water and you soak it. Then you put it in a table, a handmade table that you built with water in it. The hide is so heavy it's hard to pull and move so you can float it in water easier than you know ingenuity. And so then in, in this table there's a block of wood at an angle where the hide slides up and you put a there's a size pipe that turns. It's made out of copper so it don't rust. Behind it you put a sharp very sharp knife and in that little hole the little space you cut a piece of the hide and you pull it through. So anything that goes through that little hole is all the same size. So you pull, you move the hide, and you pull and move the hide, and you go around this great big hide till it goes down to nothing. So you have a tub full of cut hide. Then I have a special process. Uh, about 30 feet down over there, there's a machine with a wooden spool on it that's spinning with a motor. So the man ties it off. The other guy down there, he holds the hide up. You spin it till it raises off the floor about this much, then it's spun enough. Then you stop the machine, you untie it, you roll it on a spool, you tie it back up, you do the next 30 feet until the whole length is all spun and on the spool. Okay, so when it's all spun, it's all on the spool, you take the spool off, you put the spool on a roller, 
upstairs. And you tie a string on the end and you go and you hook it on a hook in the barn. Then you go to the other side of the barn, there's nails along the wall. And so you go and you hook it and you hang it up a certain height. And you come back and you hook it there and you go back there, hook it there, back there until it's all hanging to a tension where it will stretch some. And you leave it for usually 48 hours and it'll dry. Then you take it down four lengths at a time, roll it up on your arm, tie it off. And then to use it, you take what you need and you moisten it in warm water. It becomes pliable. And then when it's pliable, you put four strands this way and then you weave it on. And then you put the throwing string on. Then you wait till it dries firm. When you put it on, it's very flexible. Then it dries firm and stiff and that forms the wall. Well, I'm really happy that other people are jumping on a bandwagon and they're making sticks. Other people are. There might be, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There might be seven or eight other guys besides me now. And I trained four of them. Yeah. <laughs> but they're making sticks, and I'm really happy that they are. And they probably make more than us. Most of them make more sticks than I do. But I'm getting slower. <laughs> I do have an apprentice, yeah. Uh, his name is Parker Booth. He's from Onondaga Nation. And um, he's a hard worker, and he wants to learn. And the problem always was people want to do this. Hey, I want to make a stick. I want to do that. OK, pick up that log. <laughs> Here, take this club, let's split this wood. You know, next thing you know, the guy's sweating. And it's more work than they ever realized. It's all physical. It's really physical. Yeah. And um, this young man, Parker, is not afraid to work. And he wants to do this. He's working really hard, and he's learning how. So he's yeah. going to be there. Well, when I first started playing, uh, like, box across in the 60s, we played all outdoors, the reservation leagues in uh, New York State. And uh, there were no indoor rinks. We played outdoor all the time, which was a lot of fun. And I liked playing outdoor because of the more oxygen, it was better running, it felt pretty good. And uh, all wooden sticks. And I think it was around 1966, 67, when they just started wearing that hockey, that cap. Yeah. It didn't really, you could still knock a guy out by hitting him in the head, but at least he had a helmet. But, you know, most of the guys didn't even wear helmets. And it was unique, a time for lacrosse players. If you understand, maybe you know all the lacrosse players, you could spot them a mile away in the summertime because you had stitches on your eye and you had a fat lip and you were, had a, a broken nose or something, but, you know, your teeth were knocked out. You had a, you know, and all the lacrosse players looked like that all summer. And we liked it that way. <laughs> you know, no face mask, no helmet, none of that stuff. And the guys got all beat up. It just, that was the game. Didn't push us away, did it? No. No, but we played. Yeah, well, I figure it's, it's still going to grow. It's, there's so many pockets in the United States and Canada where they're still not playing. You know, and they're picking it up in places like Texas, uh, Florida. Georgia, places like that where it never was before. They're recruiting people from Chicago, Portland, Seattle, uh, places in Texas. You know, they're coming from all over. And I think that's going to increase, you know, more, more teams. Baseball is kind of a little too boring for modern day people. And lacrosse is picking up that slack. It's more exciting. Girls love it. Guys love it. You know, it's growing. So I think in the future, you could have a lot more players. And it seems to me like in the United States, you can see the box across growing, not just field, but box. So that's going to be an important factor. We see where that goes in 10, 20 years, which is, of course, the better game. We know that, right? <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, you watch the indoor game, box across is going to increase. It increase all over, but I think you have to watch that box lacrosse. I'm usually the only one. 
<laughs> right? I'm the only stick baker wherever I go. And this was, uh, Cattle was there and uh, uh, Travis, Travis Grabiel was there. Yeah, and it was really cool to be hanging out with those guys. Uh, what's, the, what's the other guy's name? Uh, Preston Jacob. Yeah, Preston. Yeah, that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. It takes a special person to take all that labor over 10 months to a year. You don't start this yesterday and get it done today. It's a whole lot of work, and they all understand that. You know, you, you're looking to the future every time you're working. All of them. <laughs> I would have to say all of them, but then you look at the ones who made a lot of sticks. Okay, Lally was one of the first innovators and made, he made like seven different styles of stick. You know, he had the boy stick, you know, kid stick. Um, he made many, many, many sticks. He had a real factory type thing going. And they did quality. And then there was a guy who made a double wood wall. I can't remember the, the name right now, but they made a double wood wall, which didn't last because they were too top heavy. And um, like Chisholm, Round Points, Coral Island, uh, Matthew Etienne made a lot of sticks. They made a lot of sticks. Uh, they made us look like small, small potatoes, you know. But it's like certain people in, in my time influenced my, my outlook on the stick. And one of them was Mitchell Peters from Cornwall Island. It's like people don't even know he was a good stick maker. He worked for Chisholm Round Point, but he made his own sticks on the side. And I liked his sticks. He, He's the first person I ever knew who actually had strong attention to detail. Every part of this stick was right. There was no if, maybe, no. Strong attention to detail, and I liked that. And that, that part there influenced me quite a bit. And I tell people, you don't minimize any part of the stick. You pick up a stick, you gotta have a good handle because that's what's you're touching it, right? You gotta have good balance, you gotta have a good pocket, good throwing strings, good shape. Everything makes a difference. Yeah. Attention to detail. So that was Mitchell Peters. <laughs> That's what I learned from him. But there was a lot of stick makers, so you know, over the years, um, Big Kettle's uh, grandfather was a stick maker, yeah. Yep, Williams, Logan, Martins, Squires. There's a lot of them out there. They all made a difference, you know, and I'm impressed with all of them. Yeah. Nobody tells you to make sticks. You make them because you want to. Yeah. 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 The game is going to carry itself, as far as I can see. You know, you don't have to push this game on anybody. It's coming up, you know. But the people I admire in the game, I'm not a player. You're not a player, exactly. <laughs> We're kind of, the game is behind us. The actual play in the game is behind us. But I admire people who, who keep doing things like this museum because you love the game. It's, it's worthwhile. People who do clinics, uh, tournaments, clinics, their days are past, but they're doing it for the younger people to play. They're starting up new teams. They're building. The builders are the important ones the people who give back to the game. That's who I admire in this game. Of course, you, everybody has our lacrosse fans. You know, we all do, we have our heroes out there, right? But it's the guys who give back. Those are my heroes.